everyone. Thanks a lot to the organizers for invitation. And I'm very glad to have this opportunity to share our work with you on a census of neural time scales across the mouse brain. But before going through the details, I first want to start with acknowledging all the people who've been involved in this work, especially Yang Yangshi, who has been leading this work, and also International Brain Laboratory, who has been heroically running all these experiments and analysis, and this project is also uh, related uh, to that collaboration. So animals, in order to survive in the environment, they need to perform behaviors over a broad range of time scales. For example, in the interactions between prey and predators, usually they need to have very fast movements or reactions. On the other hand, sometimes they also need to perform very slow evidence accumulations, for example, when they want to do planning or decision making, or sometimes because they just need, they have low metabolic uh, processes. And parallel to this broad range of time scales in the brain, we also have a broad range of time scales in neural activity. So, for example, here you can see these example of uh, neural activity that they fluctuate over a, a a wide range of time scales, and a common way of characterizing and quantifying these time scales is by computing the auto correlation time scale of the activity. So imagine that this is the spiking activity of a neuron. In order to compute the auto correlation, you just simply shift it in time. Then we compute the covariance between the time series that shifts the version of normalizing it by the variance. And usually these types of autocorrelations would show an exponential decay function. So to measure the time scales, we just simply fit an exponential decay function, and then this parameter tau gives us a time scale that how fast this autocorrelation decays over time. So very simple measurement. Instead of plotting these autocorrelations in logarithmic linear coordinates, we can also plot them. Oh. In uh, in, instead of plotting them in linear linear coordinates, you can plot them in logarithmic linear coordinates, and there the slope of this line would give us the time scale. And this representation of time scale is very useful if we want to study multiple time scales in the dynamics. So there we expect that if we have multiple time scales, then we would have lines with different slopes. Each of the slopes would correspond to uh, one individual time scale. So this very simple measurements have been actually related to different types of cognitive processes and functions in our brain. So now uh, there is a large body of literature across different neural modalities that suggest that neural time scales in primate cortex are hierarchically organized, meaning that neurons in sensory areas have faster time scales compared to the neurons in association areas that are involved in cognitive demanding tasks. There is also this beautiful paper that they looked at the time scales of both fMRI activity across the whole brain, and they also found this nice topographical organization of time scales across non cortical areas such as uh, hippocampus and thalamus. If we also zoom in into the time scales of neural activity within one area, we also see a large diversity of time scales. And different studies have suggested that fast neurons and slow neurons actually code for different epochs of the task or different variables of the task. And at the end, these time scales are not fixed properties of our brain, and they can adopt to the task requirements. For example, during a selective attention task or a working memory task, then uh, we would have an increase in the time scales of neural activity. While all the pictures that I showed you on my previous slide are from the primate studies and they show a very nice, coherent, consistent story, when it comes to the mouse brain, the story becomes a little bit more convoluted. So this is the first paper that kind of systematically look at the um, time scales across the mouse brain over a wide range of areas. So uh, this is a nice paper from Legal et al. from Allen Institute. And what they did is that they measured the auto predations from one second of spontaneous activity and they computed the time scale. So they call it intrinsic time scales because it's from the spontaneous activity. And then they correlated with an ensemble hierarchy score. So this is a score that we can measure from the feed forward and feedback connections. And then we would assign a number to each brain area, which would define how far along the hierarchy is this brain area. And what they reported is that there is no correlation basically between the intrinsic time scales and hierarchy scores, so there is no hierarchical organization of intrinsic time scales in the mouse brain. However, a more recent study reanalyzed the data from the same experiments, but in different epochs of those experiments, and they could actually recover this hierarchical organization of time scales 
in the mouse frame, which also was followed by another paper, which they used a different method for measuring time scales from task-driven activity. And they also showed that within the cortex, there is a correlation between the time scales and the hierarchy scales. So it looks like there is like definitely like these pictures. And if you look at the time scales on these different plots, you see that they also have a different ranges of time scale. So one might think that there might be a possibility that individual neurons are operating across different time scales. So these studies, each of them are actually picking up part of the big picture. The other interesting thing that this last study uh, made is that they also look at the uh, time scales in the thalamus, so all the red dots. So first of all, you see that most of the spring, uh, er the time scales in the thalamic area are much faster than the cortical area, which kind of fits to this story that if we go below the cortex, following this kind of hierarchical organization, they expect to have faster time scales. But if we zoom in in the thalamus and try to look at the time scales and the hierarchy score, then they didn't find any relation. So their conclusion was that subcortical areas have faster time scales, but there is no hierarchical organization in the thalamus, but it does exist in the in the mouse cortex. So now there is kind of this dichotomy. So, so from this kind of hierarchical structure of time scales, one would expect that we might need to have very fast time scales in this kind of subcortical structure. But if we look at throughout the course of the evolution, actually these subcortical structures are like midbrain, hindbrain, and cerebellum, they are the kind of structures that persisted throughout uh, the evolution and they exist in many different animals that can perform very complex computation. So my, one might also think that if neurons in these areas need to perform relevant computations and behaviors, then uh, they might need to have slow time scales. And to kind of answer these types of questions, then now we're going to measure time scales across the mouse brain going well beyond the cortex. And we want to answer basically two different questions. So one is that uh, does neural, single neurons have multiple time scales in their dynamic? And the other one is that does subcortical structures have, do subcortical structures have faster or slow time scales? So for this, we are using International Brain Laboratory Brain White Map which is data collected and analyzed across 22 computational and experimental labs using neuropixel probes. So this data covers a wide range of brain areas. So in, in our data, we have more than 27 single units uh, distributed across 308 brain areas. And the data is recorded during a, two, a version of two force choice decision-making task, which they wanted to study like how decision-making uh, is performed across multiple brain areas. So during this task, the mouse is holding a wheel and it needs to move the wheel to bring the stimulus to the center of the screen and if the, within a certain amount of time. And if it does it successfully, then it would receive a reward. And if not, it would receive a punishment. And uh, we are using the non-task driven activity for this analysis. So for each of the neurons, we also have 10 minutes of spontaneous activity that we are using for measuring uh, for using auto predictions and time scales. And then at the end of the slide, I will go back also to the task variables and how those spontaneous activity time scales might relate uh, to task variables. Just to give you a picture of like what we are adding to what has been uh, already known about neural time scales in the mouse brain. So all these blue dots are in brain areas, so cortical areas that have been studied in the studies of uh, mouse brain time scales in the previous studies, and the red areas are the thalamic areas that have been included in previous studies. And now we are adding all these new other brain areas to the picture. And just to give a sense of uh, what these brain areas are. So first of all, if you look at this picture, you might uh, agree with me that I had a very good practice of learning a lot about the mouse anatomy and the brain areas that I didn't know their names before. So we do have recordings across visual areas, mass sensory areas, motor areas, but also a lot of subcortical areas. So we have striatum, thalamus, hypothalamus, midbrain, cord medulla, and cerebral. And we want to like, measure the time scales uh, across all these different areas. So during my talk, first of all, I'm going to discuss that how we try to reliably <coughs> estimate time scales from uh, neural activity. What are the organization of time scales across the mouse brain? How these time scales might relate to behavioral variables? And some of our very initial attempts to 
trying to probe and find mechanisms for uh, to explain the diversity of time scales across the mouse brain. So let's start with estimating time scales. And the first thing I want to argue is that we do need long trials and long recording to reliably estimate time scales. And to show you why we need this, for a few moments, I'm going to just show you some statistic data from a process that we know what is a ground truth time scale and autocorrelation. So let's look at a simple stochastic process such as Ornstein Lumen process that uh, we know its autocorrelation is an exponential decay function with the given time scale tau. So in a logarithmic linear coordinate, we expect to have this straight line with this given slope. So now I simulate this process. Let's say for trials of four second duration, I compute the autocorrelation of this data. So this would be the squared line. And I want to estimate the time scales from this limited data. So what you see is that first of all, this uh, autocorrelation that we get from the simulated data deviates from the ground truth. And if we put an exponential function, it could be this other line, then the slope of this line deviates from the ground truth. So we are underestimating the ground truth time scale. And the situation gets worse when we have shorter trials, which is much closer to neuroscience experiments. So this is a known statistical problem. It's called statistical bias in the sample autocorrelation. And it basically tells us that the shape of data on correlation largely depends on how much data we have, so the duration of the trial. And we do need long trials for unbiased estimation of time scales. And if we go back to this picture that I showed you at the beginning, so the difference between these two pictures might actually, at least part of it, is because of the might be because of this bias. So they are using one second spontaneous activity to measure autocorrelation. And in the newer one, they are using 20 minutes. So it might be that this study is measuring less biased uh, estimates of, of time scale. So in neuroscience experiments, we always don't have long trials. And for this, we actually developed a method that relies on generative models. It's a Bayesian method to estimate time scales. I don't go to the details of it. If you're interested and you want to measure time scales, come and talk to me afterward. But we use this method on a subset of our data just to make sure that the trial durations that we have are long enough to reliably estimate the time scales. And this is the case. But in the rest of the study, all the results that I'm going to show you is not uh, using this method, but just fitting the exponential function that I will tell you in a minute. So just to give you a sense of what we are trying to fit, so these are kind of example single unit autocorrelations across all these different brain areas that we just picked randomly. And I hope that you can appreciate that there is a variety of shape of autocorrelation shapes across this data. And even if we look at a single brain area, so now we are looking at primary visual cortex, you can see that even within the brain area, we do have diversity of shapes. So here we have this autocorrelation that looks like it has one individual slope, so it might be a single time scale neuron, but this autocorrelation is decaying faster at the beginning and slower in later lag. So we might have more than one time scale and for this neuron. So to kind of reliably estimate the number of number and the values of time scales across uh, different neurons, then we use the following procedure. So for each neuron, we've been spiking activity in five millisecond time bin, and then we compute the autocorrelation of the spike term. And then what we do is that we fit this autocorrelation with four different models. So the first model is the simple model that usually people would use for estimating time scales. So it's just a single exponential decay function. But we also fit a uh, mixture of exponentials. So a mixture of two exponentials, three, and four. And in the next slide, I will tell you why we don't go beyond uh, four exponential decay stage. After we fit each neuron with these four different models, then we use Bayesian information criteria to select the best fitting model. So Bayesian information criteria also takes into account the complexity of the model. Uh, so that's why it tried to fit, uh, pick the simplest possible model. We also want it to be a little bit more stringent and avoid like additional um, diversity in, in the parameter. So what we do is that we add an additional constraint that if we, pick, we add a time scale to the model, we want it to at least explain 1% of the data. So the coefficient should be at least 0 0.01. So after applying these two criteria, then we pick the best model, but we also go further. So what we do is that we use uh, coefficients of determination to compute uh, the quality of our fits, because we are only fitting four different models, and there is no guarantee that the best model is within this range. 
So we only uh, include the uh, neurons in our analysis that are better, so that they have a quality of fit that the coefficient of their determination can explain more than 50% of the variance. And if it's not, then we would exclude that neuron from our analysis. So for included neurons, we would have a selective model, and we also define an effective time scale. So because we have a multi time scale neurons and we want to have one measure for each neuron for the comparison, this effective time scale is just a weighted sum of all the time scales that we fit for the model that is selected. So to give a sense of how much data we are actually throwing away for our analysis, so this is the distribution of R squared across all the more than 27,000 neurons. And this red line is our exclusion criteria. So you can see that we're throwing away like kind of half of our data. And you might then come to me and say, oh, you're throwing half of your data. That's just, it doesn't make sense. What are you doing? But I can show you what this half of the data looks like. So I hope you can agree with me that these neurons have very nice outer coordination and don't show any like real temporal structure. We can talk about it afterwards, why they look like this. But for the sake of this talk, we're only looking at this part of the data. And for the neurons that we included, so this is the statistics of the model that they selected. So you can see the majority of neurons are better fitted with two time scales, and very few neurons need up to four time scales, so only eight neurons. So that's why we didn't go beyond fitting uh, four time scales, because most of the neurons can be explained with one, two, three time scales. So now that we have Kind of a reliable estimation of time scales, let's go and see how they are distributed across the brain. So let's first look at what is the distribution of this kind of model comparison results. So for the eight neurons that needed four time scales, they are all in the cerebellum. But for the rest of the neurons, so one time scale, two time scale, and three time scale neurons, they're kind of distributed everywhere. So it's not like we do have one brain area with only single time scale neurons, one brain area with two time scale neurons. In each area, we have kind of a distribution, a mixture of different neuron types in, in the sense of time scale. So the first thing we did is that we wanted to try this kind of relationship between hierarchy score and time scale, similar to the previous study. So what we did is that we computed the relationship, uh, the correlation between the effective time scale and the hierarchy score. Uh, both new, in the cortex and the thalamus, and you can see that in the cortex, we, it's very similar to the last two studies. We also have a correlation between the time scale and hierarchy, uh, hierarchy score in the cortex, but not in the thalamus. And you might also think, okay, maybe this effective time scale is a super processed type of time scale, but we can also get the same picture if you look at individual fidget time scales. So as an example, I'm showing you the, the two time scale neurons that were the majority of our neurons. So tau one is the fast time scale and tau two is the slow time scale. And you can see that kind of for both fast and slow time scales, we do get the same structure in the cortex and, and no correlation in the thalamus. So this is kind of consistent with the last two previous studies. So now let's go and look at the whole brain activity and the time scale. So here. We are plotting the median of the time scale for each brain area. And you can see that we have a dark blue shape for this kind of cerebral midbrain and this kind of subcortical structures, uh, which means that they have much lower time scales. We can see this also better in this picture. So each of the bars I'm plotting here is the median of the time scales in each area. And the error bars are showing 25 up to 75 percentile of the data. And I hope that you can also appreciate that we have much longer time scales within this kind of midbrain and hindbrain areas compared to the to the cortex. And I think this is nicely. So when I was looking at Michael's talk, I was thinking, oh, this is very nicely fits to his analysis because he also shows that these brain areas are involved in evidence accumulation. So this might be a part that these might be relevant uh, for that they are intrinsically having neurons with very slow time scales. So. Uh, after seeing that neurons in uh, kind of the subcortical structure have interstitial time scales, now these the next two parts that I'm going to show you they are, they are like very ongoing parts, so very fresh plots that uh, we did. And the first one is how these time scales are related to the task variable. And for this, we are looking at three task variables: so the visual stimuli, the choice, and feedback. And the first thing we do is that we compute if 
for each individual neuron if they are significantly coding for any of these three task variables. Then what we do is that we divide the neurons based on this coding for the task variables into two separate groups. So the neurons that significantly code for that task variables and the neurons that uh, do not significantly code for that uh, task variable, and then we compare the time scales across the two groups. And here you can see that uh, for the visual stimulus, there is no difference between the neurons that code for the stimulus and the neurons that do not code for the stimulus. But for the choice and feedback, we see that neurons that code for these two variables have significantly longer time scales uh, than the neurons that they do not. So it kind of suggests that they, there is some relationship between these inference of time scales and the task variables and the decision making there. The another ongoing part of our project is trying to find possible mechanisms to explain the diversity of time scales, because it, as I showed you at the beginning, if we zoom in in each of these brain areas, we also see that they exhibit a wide range of time scales, and we wanted to know why within each brain area we might have this variability of time scales. And previous theoretical studies suggest that both individual neuron properties and the connectivity between them might be relevant for explaining time scales. And we thought maybe gene expression can be a good proxy to kind of relate this together because it defines both the cell size and to some extent the wiring between them. So this analysis is very similar to the analysis that uh, Olivier showed you in the previous session. So we use the gene expression profile, so special gene expression profile from Allen gene expression as well, and also another data set. And what we want to do is we use a regression model to predict the variability of time scales in each brain area. So what we found is that the special profile of gene expression explains something between like 5% to 10% of the variance, which is not a lot. So it means that there are, might be a lot of other things that are involved to explain this variability of time scale. But I think the interesting thing is that when we compare this to how much like anatomical parcellation can explain, this is much uh, bigger, which is very similar to the other results uh, that Gall and Olivier showed you in the previous session. We are now also looking at the individual genes and how each of them can contribute in explaining these time scales, and we are kind of making some progress. And now we can guess that probably in the next step, I need to learn a lot of names of the genes to give an example. Uh, and so to summarize, I showed you that there are multiple time scales in the dynamics of individual neurons. We have super slow time scales in the midbrain and hindbrain areas, which is a bit surprising if we consider like the hierarchical organization. And neurons in the, uh, with slow time scales might be relevant for coding choice and feedback. And spatial organization of time scales can be, to some extent, explained uh, by the gene expression, but at least better than the anatomical, uh, anatomical parcellation. And these are like the two parts that we are now looking into to see like what we see across individual brain areas or across individual genes. And with that, I would like to thank again all the people who have been involved in this for our funding sources and thanks to you for your attention.